I am uh, David Scare, a professor of uh, New Testament and Dogmatics at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. Today we want to pay attention to the epistle appointed for the, uh, what, what is called Easter II, or the first Sunday after Easter, taken from the first epistle of John. I'm going to make um, customary, it is to preach on the gospel, not the epistle. Uh, but this is an epistle that can be integrated into the gospel for the day without too much difficulty. So we'll take a look at this, and we're going to go through this word by word, more or less. Um, it's jo Johannine Greek is a little bit is about the easiest in the New Testament, and I appreciate that very much. That which was from the beginning, it certainly has overtones of the um, of the of the Gospel for, of John chapter of the uh, the first verse of the Gospel of John in the beginning, from the beginning. But now here the beginning refers to the word RK refers to what God is doing in Jesus Christ. That is the beginning. Um, there's a switch. Uh, now, since the first uh, creation did not work out so well, it now begins in Christ. And then here comes some verbs here in which the uh, writer identifies himself of actually being a witness of Jesus Christ, which we heard, which we were seen, with our, he adds, with our eyes. So uh, this is not an illusion. Now, I think this is important to indicate in preaching that the resurrection of Jesus is something which is a tangible act in history. So he puts in with, uh, with our eyes. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't have to use the word our. Uh, he could use the word my, but he sees himself as part of a, of a community which we observed. Here is our word uh, for theater, which kind of indicates that it was over. It was not a one-time act. And our hands, again, our hands, indicating this is a community action. He's not the only witness uh, to Jesus Christ, which we have touched. You will see the word psalm concerning the word of life. Here, the word of life is a reference also again. Uh, it's used in the same way as in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word concerning the word of life, uh, the word who is life, the word who uh, gives life. The word here is the person who is the perfect expression of the Father. Now, when you come to a text like this, I don't think it can be expected of us that we can preach the whole thing or that we can only uh, take out one thrust. Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to choose one, th uh, one thrust over against the other. And um, in, th there seems to be here a similar, something similar to the gospel for the day, which is the uh, gospel of Thomas, because I think that's misapplied and misunderstood in speaking about the, dom the doubting Thomas. The story of Thomas is included as a confirming or an additional witness that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And the life was appeared, and we saw and we witnessed, and we announced to you the, uh, the eternal life which was with uh, the Father, and he has appeared, he has appeared to us. Yeah, now comes the question. Yeah, you see, you asked by the way, uh, is this a law and a gospel pericope? I think in this kind of a case, uh, the uh, law and gospel is overused and does not necessarily apply because this, is, this particular pericope focuses on what God is in himself. God is himself life. The Father has life in himself, and he shares it with the Son. There is nothing in, this per, in, in the epistle, at least so far, that is not found in the gospel, or this is an extension of what is in the gospel. He appeared to us. And then going down to verse 3, this we have seen and we have heard, and we, what we have seen and heard we announce to you also, so that you may have 
uh, fellowship with us. Now here we have to stop because we, we move very nicely and that the appearances of Jesus to the disciples after the resurrection was not simply for their own benefit or enjoyment or amazement, but it had a purpose and that the uh, Christians, the hearers, may be joined to, uh, to God. And so that's the word koinonia here, koinonia. Our participation is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, this word koinonia, this is the same word that's used in the Lord's Supper. Is it not the, um, the bread which we break? Is it not the participation in the body of Christ? It's also used of the Holy Ghost, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the participation, the koinonia. So the purpose of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ is that we may share in the Father and through his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the, the, important, the important words here are Jesus. It, it is something which has happened in history. Um, who, uh, we go down to the first, uh, verse 4, and we write these things so that, you, uh, so that your joy may reach its completion. Um, yes, now, if you are looking for a if you are looking for a sermon on the authority of the scripture, you have it in this word, uh, graph omen, which we write, which, which indicates that the writer understood, understood who he was, and he understood himself as an, as an authority, that he had the right to do this. We write to you. And there comes a kind of a punch in these words, we write to you, because if it's a letter, it's self-understood that somebody write it, uh, wrote it. So here the meaning is, this, has, this is the, the word in the, in the singular, graphe, would be the scriptures. We write that your joy may be full. Now, completed. Now, or reach its intended goal. Uh, from this, you can, uh, you, you, you can posit... Um, or suggest here is that these Christians who are receiving this letter may have been a little bit concerned. There may have been things in their life and in their faith which was causing them some difficulty because by using this words that it may be completed or come to its intended goal, there was still something missing in their faith. And it could have been uh, the lack of certainty in the resurrection. And now moving to verse 5. And this was the message which we heard from him and we announced to you. Now, the question is, where does, uh, where did the writer get his information or the data that he's including in his epistle? Where, where did he get it? And uh, it says right here, from him which seems to be a reference to Jesus, uh, I think, obviously, to announce, uh, which is important because we speak about the inspiration of the scriptures, but at the same time, we want to um, mention that the disciples, the apostles, were the eyewitnesses. So the message which they, uh, the message which they recorded in the scriptures was not in something which the Holy Ghost told them in, internally, but something which they actually participated in. Uh, and we announced this to you, and what did they announce? That God is light and there is no darkness in him. Uh, the, here, you, here you have the, the contest between good and evil. God is um, in no way does God have any evil in him. Now, moving on to verse 6. And by the way, that is also, uh, uh, that is also a topic for, for preaching. Um, a funeral sermon, obviously, but other kinds of situation. And that is 
uh, certainly as preachers, we are always um, have to, uh, under, uh, we understand that we come face to face with evil in the world, and that's the way the world is, and sin, it will always be evil, and God in no way is responsible for that. Uh, if we have, if we are participating with him, that is with God, and in him, and in him we walk, and any, if, if anybody participates with God and walks around in darkness, that means sin, we lie and we do not know the truth, which says you, know, you cannot live a life of open sin and at the same time claim that you're in communion uh, with Jesus Christ and with God. Uh, if we walk around in the light as he, uh, as he is in the darkness, we have, here, here we have, it's a beautiful passage after speaking about the impossible, possibility of being a sinner and being in God, a solution is found in verse 7 that if we go into darkness, there is an answer to our problem. Uh, we, have, we have fellowship with them and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sins. Now for those people who like to, or those preachers who like to bring in the concept of the sacraments into their sermons, this is a perfect one because the word blood is Eucharistic. Oh, yes. Oh, here. The Haima, the Tahaima Yesu, the blood of his son is Eucharistic, the Lord's Supper. The word Katharizo is baptismal. And this writer combines the effect, the effects of the two sacraments into one. And he, then he moves on. First of all, he says we, it's impossible to live in sin and participate in God. Then he says, well, if we do get into this kind of a difficulty, there is an answer, and that is the blood of Christ. And the answer here is uh, by using the sacramental language, and he does use it. We're not superimposing anything into the text. By using that, uh, he is suggesting an answer is to be found in the sacraments, uh, uh, if we say we have to, then he moves on to the fact that it's impossible to avoid. It's impossible to avoid sin if we, if we say, if we claim, I omen on that we have no sin. We're deceiving ourselves. Now that's an, that, that can either be passive, or it can be middle. And, of course, this opens an opportunity for a sermon in itself. Here, the word planomen, the English word planet. Um, it, a person who, uh, a, a body in the heavens that does not keep a, a, a steady or a, a steady way that, uh, in comparison with the stars. We deceive ourselves or we are deceived. The passive would suggest that Satan is deceiving us. And the truth is not in us. Now, truth is one way in which Christ is explained. Here, here it's, he's speaking to a real uh, congregational setting. If we confess the sins of ours. Now, this uh, notice by the again the use of the plural, we, not I. He, so he speaks as a member of the congregation. He speaks as one who is with him that engages this. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, I wonder if that is possibly a reference to a part of the early church ritual that, that we uh, uh, confess our sins. This appears in the epistle of James too. If a person confesses his sins, he'll be forgiven. God, oh, he is faithful and just. Now, this is an amazing statement, and that is that God's, God is consistent in his promises. That's what the word pistos means here. He can be depended upon. It's, he does not change his mind, and he is righteous, so that he forgives us our sins and cleanses us 
from all unrighteousness. What is so great about this particular pericope is that um, it's easy to uh, it's easy to read in the Greek language, which is something I appreciate, and it also fits very nicely in with the uh, post Easter gospel of the appearing to um, both Peter and to Thomas in John 20 and 21. Now in verse 10, if we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar and his word is not, is not in us. I'm always in, I'm, it must happen at least two or three times a week at least in our morning newspaper, and that you have to love yourself. That's the most important thing. Here, by the way, it takes an entirely different tactic. If we say we have no sin, we make him a liar. And the liar in this sense, God says that we are sinners and we say are without sin. Now, if that's a person's opinion, you're saying that God is a liar. He's false because we are good and God does not. God's assessment of ourselves is not true. And his word is not in us. Now that's an amazing phrase too because here, does the term logos, does this refer to the incarnate logos, Jesus Christ? Or does it mean a spoken word or a message? I don't know if we have to choose between the two, but I think it would be better to take this as a reference that if we acknowledge that we have, if we say we have no sins, then Christ is not dwelling in us. Now here he uses the term technia. Technon is a child. It can be uh, here the metaphorical use and the literal use, I think have something to say and one does not exclude the other. Um, he speaks to them as, little, as, as children. They are his disciples. This is not unusual because Jesus will also speak of the disciples as children. But that doesn't exhaust the meaning of the word technia. It could also mean children in the congregation. Uh, and then, of course, this would allow a sermon on infant baptism. Children are part of the, of, of, the, of the kingdom of God. They are part of it. Uh, it's, just to take this in a metaphorical sense, uh, if, if all Christians are like children and are, are, and are part of the congregation, then it is also true that the children are part of the congregation. A good opportunity to preach a sermon on uh, having the children, uh, bringing the children to church and having the children sit through the church service, uh, at least from my own observation, uh, uh, they might be inattentive at times, inattentive, but at other times they're quite attentive. And as they grow older, that's not a problem. You speak if it's a lack of attention is, uh, makes a person unfit to sit in church, we'd have to get rid of also a lot of older people too. These things I write to you that you do not sin. Notice the way the word grapho. He, he asserts, he places himself again as a person who must be listened to. Now, was this letter written to one congregation or is this what we call a Catholic epistle and written about, 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 uh, to a number of congregations? I don't know if that distinction is so valid because the writer, whoever he was, expected that his letter would last long after he lived and he understood that the letter, uh, we should really call it an epistle because it was not a personal letter as we write letters. This was an epistle. It was a treatise. It was a dogmatics. It was something which informed the people about the Christian life. I write to you that you do not sin. Now, you can say that the writer really has not made up his mind whether these people are sinners or not. But he does, 
he does grasp the dilemma of the Christian life. You don't say to people, you, you can't sin anymore, but we'll make exceptions. It's, he writes so that they can live a life without sin. But then he puts in a backup phrase, knowing that they will. But you can't ever preach a conditional statement. Um, but, well, maybe you will sin or maybe you won't. He writes them that you may not sin. Uh, this, uh, this, ha this ca carries the idea that what he is writing has the authority and the power to give these people what they want, or what is needed. There is, there, and I'm going to say this kind of course, to say there is meat in the words themselves. Uh, these are just not ideas that you may not sin. Subjunctive there. And, but then look at what he does. And if we do sin, he goes into reverse. He goes either, he's either in, in drive, going along at 80 miles an hour, or he's in reverse. There is, no, there is no shortage here. We have an advocate with the Father. Here's the word parakleton. We have a paraclete, the English word paraclete, is ordinarily used of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, says, I will send you the paraclete. Uh, the closest uh, uh, I don't know if we can get the, oh, if we have an exact English word for that, but the paraclete is most best likely traded as an attorney. And uh, of course, here's another op an opportunity for another kind of a sermon. And that is, I have never been put on trial. But uh, if you uh, have any, if you have anything to do with the law, the, the legal profession. Uh, you know, the attorney wants you to take his or her advice and you're not supposed to speak. Because if you speak, you might incriminate yourself. You'll say the wrong thing. You'll not advance your cause. It says, we have a paraclete with the Father. And notice the word pros, uh, pros ton um, patera. He is standing... He is standing face to face with the Father. You can almost, if you want to use the legal language, you can say he passed the bar. Uh, that means he was allowed to speak to the judge. If you don't, you're not, no, a person is not allowed to cross the boundary over uh, and speak to the judge directly unless the judge asks you, ask you a question. But we have somebody who has we have an advocate with the Father. We have a paraclete. He is able to represent us. And this is Jesus Christ, who himself is without sin. He is a dick eye on he is this. Now, and not only that, not only is he situated to, um, to address the Father, but he has already paid the penalty for any sin so if it should turn out that there is something against us, he is here. He is the propitiation, the hilosmos, and boy, is that really uh, for our sins. If there is, if there is ever a problem in uh, Christian faith, it has to do with the doctrine of the atonement. And um, the uh, that was denied. The doctrine was, has been denied, was denied by the rationalists who said the purpose of Christ's life was to show us how to live, which is true. And, uh, but the, he, has, he, he has already paid the penalty. Should we be found guilty, he has already paid the penalty, the hilosmos, for our, not only for our sins, but for, not for us only, but for the sins of the whole world. This is absolutely magnificent. It's bringing out the theme, so that God so loved, loved the world. Um, no, this will be a pericope, should you choose to preach on it for Vespers or during the week or whenever you do it. Uh, it'll be very easy to do it, and you will have a lot to say, 
And if in the following year you have to preach on it again, it'll, uh, you'll be all ready to go again. Uh, thank you very much. And I wish you the very best as you carry out your re responsibility of proclaiming Jesus Christ to your congregation and to the world. Now that was, it's not, it's not just, it's not just uh, the Christians who are saved are justified. He, his, he is the God man and his sacrifice is valid for everybody. Thank you very much.